cool. Um, there's an interesting sign up here. All I saw was, Mike, close your mouth. That's not going to work so well, but so thanks, Owen. Um, my name is Andrew Ross. Um, I work for an organization called the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, we help open source projects and open data projects. Um, I'm actually not here to talk a lot about that today, uh, although we do have some talks coming up this afternoon that are location tech projects, and I'll talk a little bit about more about that later. Um, so uh, my talk's actually a little different than a lot of the talks this morning, so I'm not talking about any specific technology. It's actually in a way more of a non-technical talk. Um, it's um, also in a way probably uh, a funny point in the schedule because I'm actually talking a little bit about sort of setting the stage for big data. Um, and so Marcus's talk and Peter's talk um, uh, was very, very much related to what I'm going to talk about. So uh, before I do, whoops, let me just do this. I can actually use my magic slide sorter. So before I do talk about that, I just do want to do a quick shout out uh, to an event taking place in March in California. Uh, I'm the conference chair and actually we have a number of our team here today. So if you guys just want to wave your hands, uh, there's Rob there and there's a few other people here. I think is Andy here today as well? I guess not. So um, uh, it takes place in sunny California. So uh, certainly the weather today is helping us uh, market this event. Uh, it's a great event focusing a lot on open source geospatial technologies, open data technologies. Uh, it's a lot of fun. If you haven't been to a Phosphor G before, um, come to this one or come to another one. There's actually ones in Europe and in uh, Phosphor G Korea coming up in the fall. Uh, really, really great events with lots of uh, really great speakers and content. So um, how many people have heard the term software is eating the world before? Really? I'm surprised by that. Um, so uh, Mark Andreessen, he's a guy involved with founding Netscape uh, back in the day, he wrote a famous blog. I think it actually became a Wall Street Journal article talking about how software is eating the world. Um, what's interesting about it, and this is, uh, you'll see how this fits into my talk in a minute, is that almost everything uh, out there today uh, has software integrated, uh, integrated into it. So consumer devices, automotive uh, um, uh, vehicles and whatnot. Uh, and so in a lot of ways, even companies who aren't software companies uh, start to look and smell a lot like a software company. They have software developers on staff. Uh, they have issues affecting their products and services that are software issues. Uh, and so in a way, software is very rapidly becoming uh, an integral part of, uh, of business, even if you're a grocery store or a uh, waste disposal company or you know, companies that wouldn't normally have anything to do with software per se. Um, so this is not terribly surprising. Um, so. Uh, I do a different ver version of this talk where I say it's their fault and their fault and their fault. Uh, that basically um, uh, software and data is becoming a big problem. Um, simply put, uh, we're, we're generating more data. So a couple of the talks earlier, you know, Marcus and Peter talked about that, how data is becoming almost overwhelming. I think it's actually long past overwhelming. Um, there was just an article the other day in Canada where I'm from where our uh, national security agency is saying, yeah, we've got the data, but there's just too darn much of it and we can't make sense of it. It's just coming in too fast and we can't process it. And so even though we had it, and if we actually go back and look in retrospect, we can see the things that tell us that you know problems happen. So when somebody came up onto Parliament Hill uh, with a gun, you, they actually had the, 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 the data, the evidence to indicate that that was likely to happen, but they couldn't get to it in time. Um, so not surprising, um, we are overwhelmed with data. Um, the other thing, and I just a uh, quick point here about computer computer vision and some of the machine learning and automation stuff that's happening is that this is continuing to accelerate. Uh, I think it's going to get you know get self-driving cars who are able to go into an unexplored area and actually map it automatically and you know generate and send data back. Uh, I think it's going to get uh, more and more out of hand. So uh, the point of that is we're simply drowning in data. Um, now, um, when you uh, hear people talk and write about uh, big data, you hear them talk about uh, the three V's or sometimes five V's or six V's or you know, things, but the key ones are basically velocity, uh, variety, and volume. Um, it's more than that because if you think about it, and I think each of you in this room um, live this every day, you're taking data from a number of different sources. So you might be taking OpenStreetMap data, you might be taking GeoNames data, you know, points of interest data from other sources. You might be taking nat national we weather agency in your country, uh, data from there. Uh, so you're taking data from a number of different sources. There's one person I was talking to from the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. Uh, they take data from 90 different sources. Uh, and so for them, it's very overwhelming to take the, that data, those data sets, conflate them, and actually get to something that they can use. Uh, and then by the time they get it, the data is already out of date, and they have to start over and do it again. Uh, it's a very painful process. Now, the other thing I want to say is this is really important. Um, I don't know if you've 
um, been in a major city where there's a, a, a transit um, system breaks down or trying to fly from one place in the world to another part in the world where the, the, the flight system, the aviation system just breaks down and things aren't working properly. Um, you know, transportation, communications, agriculture, entertainment, everything is, is software and data related. Uh, so if basically these things don't work, uh, we have a very bad day and society starts to crumble. Um, it actually kind of scares me. Uh, so uh, in a previous lifetime, I worked in telecom where we try to make everything five and six times bulletproof reliable and try to anticipate any possible failure uh, and actually have geo redundancy with one set of switches on one side of the world, another set of switches on another side of the world. Uh, not everything's built that way. Uh, and so it's actually quite scary that software and data uh, makes society so brittle. So um, in addition to all this, um, we're actually interacting with data. So um, I'm sure many of you are emailing back and forth and actually um, looking at the schedule and you know, doing um, bi-directional data flows in terms of uh, figuring out what your, what your day looks like, figuring out what it is, what it is you're going to do next, maybe communicating with uh, friends around the world. Um, so it's not just simply taking something and downloading it. It's actually you're taking something, downloading it, modifying it, sharing part, you know, partial data back or complete data back or distributing it to somebody else. Uh, and so it's those workflows that make things a lot more complicated. And so again, you know, the types of things, social media, smartphones, uh, really make this so much easier than it used to be. And the interfaces are actually becoming a, a lot easier to do this. So um, in my mind, what's happening is this. <coughs> We're going from a system where um, we have more need for real-time um, uh, interactions with the data. We want to know what's happening right now. We don't want to know what's happening, you know, last week, last month, last year. Some people are doing research and, you know, to look at that, and that's good and important. But increasingly, we want to know what's really happening right now. Uh, and also, the, the interactions with the data are becoming increasingly complex. So um, uh, for those of you, I imagine most of you are, are, you, most of you are developers. Just a quick show of hands, who, who develop, develop software in here? Okay, almost everybody, cool. So you guys know all about Git, you know all about distributed version controls, um, you, know all, you know what I'm talking about. It basically, um, there is no one central version of the truth, there's no um, uh, one uh, central place where everybody downloads the data and that's exactly uh, the version for everybody. It's actually very much more complicated and nuanced and people are constantly interacting and changing and making, making adjustments all the time. So with what I talked about earlier, you know, much of our world depends on software and data. Um, I kind of laugh because people get really bent out of shape and saying, oh, Google's taking over the world or, or Esri is taking over the world or used to be Microsoft is taking over the world. So for those of you, I've been doing uh, open source uh, and a little bit of open data, but mostly open source software uh, since the 90s, actually the early 90s. And back then we were deathly afraid of Microsoft. Microsoft has so much power. I don't think anybody is all that terribly afraid of Microsoft anymore. I think things have changed quite dramatically. So I, I'm not actually all that bothered by any one particular vendor uh, because things change over time. That um, if you look at you know look at Apple, Apple's you know printing money hand over fist are hugely successful today, but if they don't learn how to do something else, you know well, then in time what they did so well that made them a lot of money becomes kind of irrelevant and something else replaces it. So I'm not all that excited about um, uh, single vendors. Now what this really means is that no single vendor can actually solve these problems. Uh, it's not going to be a Google thing. It's not going to be an Apple thing, a Facebook thing, or you know, you pick your vendor. Uh, no one government can solve these things. Uh, so the only way to do this, and this is very topical uh, given that we're here at an open source conference, is that we need to collaborate. So how do we do that? Um, so um, this is basically what I do for a living, is encourage people uh, that they can do this successfully, and they're not actually giving up things that are important to them, like making money, um, having gainful employment, um, basically being able to collaborate with other people and share their research, share their data, uh, and basically make society better. Uh, and so generally, this is a, you know, one simple way of looking at it, but uh, people collaborate on the commodity components. Um, so they do things, if, if it doesn't make sense, and, and in the past, um, especially in terms of, of the types of, of functions and libraries that you guys use, um, I used to run around from company to company and say, is there something unique about how you calculate the area of a polygon? Is there something unique about how you calculate the length of a line stream? You know, you, you calculate how they overlap or intersect or, you know, all kinds of simple features, you know, uh, from, from what you see. Do you do that somehow different and special uh, compared to your competitor? And the funny part is they all go, absolutely not. Um, and I said, well, why on earth are you writing the same software, you know, as your, as your competitor to everybody else? And in fact, when there's good open source libraries out there that you should be using, you should be contributing back to. Uh, and so in a lot of cases, um, that was convincing to them. I said, you're right. Uh, we should actually collaborate. We should look for these kinds of opportunities. Um, and so this is, this is important. Now, on the other side of things, uh, here in this audience, 
Um, I can tell you, I've been doing uh, software for at least 25 years, and I've worked with people who have been doing it even longer than I have. There is never going to be one true open data center with all open software. It's just not going to happen. So we have to be realistic. You're going to have a pragmatic mix of open and proprietary technologies. That's just the way the world works. Uh, and so we have to be mindful of that. Um, and actually having these kinds of models which allow part open participation and collaboration, they're really important. So. Now what's neat about them, and it's um, for those of you who haven't been heavily immersed in open source uh, communities and collaboration, is this phenomenon. So I have a more complicated version of this talk where I start to talk about uh, different companies forming partnerships and working together. And so point to point, all right, you got one set of non-disclosure agreements, one set of, of what the rules of the road are for working with each other. Uh, you add in a third organization, all of a sudden it's complicated because you have a separate set of documents between each of those three organizations. You add four, it just becomes overwhelming. So we get to five, six, ten, it's a nightmare. Uh, and so they just simply cannot uh, collaborate effectively. And so this is why doing this in an open source uh, project community foundation makes so much sense, is that you, you really minimize, minimize some of that uh, low value or even no value overhead um, and allows you to be a lot more effective. So um, getting back to the themes that we talked about with uh, big data, um, really what we want is to be able to have big data, and I'm, I'm, I'm picking on a few specific projects, and I, and I actually don't mean to be offensive and exclude other ones, because there's a lot of really amazing um, uh, projects on all aspects of this kind of technology stack. Uh, so Peter's um, Razaman project is a fantastic uh, big data project that sits over here with, with the Omerta GeoCharles GOG. This is just to keep it concise. So take this with a grain of salt. I'm not trying to uh, uh, exclude others. It's just there's so many good technologies that uh, I can't include them all. So what we really want is we don't want big data on everything, right? When you're running around with your smartphone, uh, you're not gonna have a terabyte of data on your smartphone, that's ridiculous. You're not gonna have a terabyte of data in your car. What you really need is just the data um, for the area of the city that you happen to be in or just the points of interest for the area you're interested in, in, in traveling to, um, just when you need it. And you wanna make sure that it's, it's current. You wanna be sure you can update it and pull down any changes. So really what we need is actually we need little data uh, that is a subclass of big data uh, and we may be, be, be able to push and pull back and forth uh, effectively and efficiently. Uh, so this was really neat about these projects that I'm talking about here is that some of these guys, uh, particularly you're gonna hear uh, Rob later on talking about the GeoCharles project um, on the mobile side, you're gonna hear Manuel talking about mobile map technology. What's cool about those is um, they are architected from the ground up to solve particular problems, to, to be very, very high performant uh, in the case of GeoCharles or in mobile map te technology to be um, very consistent across multiple mobile mobile platforms and very fast uh, and, and have uh, certain uh, features and capabilities that make them very well suited to this type of thing. Now, um, bridging between them is very important as well. So you wanna, you're not gonna, as I said, pull down that big data and put it on your smartphone. Uh, what you wanna do is basically have something that gets just the data you want and allows you to, to, to manage it in a sensible way. So almost all the hands went up when you guys asked if you were developers. Uh, and what that means is that you guys know all about Git or Mercurial or other distributed version control technologies. So when I talk about GeoGig, uh, which is basically a um, Git-like implementation for spatial data, you probably nod your head and go, okay, that sounds kind of cool. Uh, so I basically take data from OpenStreetMap or PostGIS or Oracle Spatial or SQL Server, uh, pull it down to have a local copy of it, make changes, you know, obviously as you're making changes, just like you would with Git for source code, you can actually see wha who changed what, why they changed it. Um, compare two versions, uh, ch push and pull changes back and forth between different people. Uh, so it's a, it's a really um, game-changing protocol in service and library and, and way to, to, to deal with data. And so I think it's, it's quite cool is what these type of technologies are gonna open up is suddenly we can do these kinds of things. Um, I don't even necessarily the think the big guys are doing an exceptionally good job about this. So, I mean, yes, uh, what, what Google is doing is very cool and they are definitely a leader in, in, in many ways. But I think in, in a lot of ways, as technology changes and innovation happens, uh, it's gonna hit them as well. And so I think, I think um, this open collaboration around some of these technologies, uh, especially when you build up a big community, they may become sort of a de facto standard, implementing open standards. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a, a very interesting thing in terms of what it, what it means for the world and for society, so. Now, um, I didn't talk a little bit about it my slides. I actually was gonna do this talk without slides at all. So that might have been a little bit weird, but. <laughs> Um, actually, I think, it's, I think it's a lot more fun and more, and more interesting, but uh, one thing I do want to talk about is it's actually not technology for technology's sake. Uh, and that's the thing uh, us as technologists, we, we lose sight of. Uh, I can't tell you, so I mean, I've been doing software for 25 years, and I can't tell you how many times people's eyes glaze over as I start, start talking about how fast something is, or 
you know, how much better this protocol is or how much more robust this protocol is. It's not about that at all. And you guys know this because these are the types of things you're doing. It's actually about making society better. So let's plan the city better. Let's uh, be better stewards for the environment. Uh, let's, uh, I talked about security. So let's basically use that data and figure out what's going to happen and see if we can prevent it. I mean, obviously, we can't always. And we've got to make sure our society remains an open uh, society and, and welcoming to all. But these are the types of things that, uh, that we want to do. So it's actually more about the people and the society side than it is necessarily about the, uh, uh, about the technology for itself. So now that said, I like cool technology just like you guys. So, so just to um, almost wrap up, I got, I think, two more slides. Uh, so there's another cool project that I didn't talk about here. Um, if you guys haven't seen it, please do check out Graph Hopper. Uh, it's an amazing routing library. Uh, it's super, super fast and really cool. And um, uh, the work that Peter's doing on that is just amazing. Um, you're going to see Manuel talk today about mobile map technology, which is an awesome and amazing library. There's another one out there uh, by a gentleman named Steve Gifford called Whirly Globe and Maply. Also really cool uh, and, and, and really neat and definitely something you need to see. And in fact, uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff and when you like Manuel's talk, come see us after because we can, we can demo for you um, right in front of you with our smartphones and stuff and show you the kinds of things you can do. Uh, so Patrick Cozy and the Cesium team, this is a talk here today talking about uh, the integration between Cesium and Open Layers 3, which is actually another talk I, I encourage you to check out. Um, the, uh, there's a really cool, cool project that was born out of Phosphor G in Portland last year called uh, GeoLoad. So it's another initiative I, I encourage you to check out. So b it's not just about, um, as we're talking, version controlling data. It's actually finding the data in the first place. And so what GeoLoad and there's other initiatives out there aim to do is, is become sort of an index of where you can get great data sources, you know, free data sources that you can use stuff for. So um, Location Tech is a community that I'm heavily involved with, and some of the projects listed below uh, are, are instances of projects that are hosted there. So we do all kinds of uh, services, so you know, legal services and IT infrastructure services and uh, build uh, release engineering services. So basically, whatever we can do to help the projects to be successful. And so um, I can encourage you to check it out. So just to wrap up, um, enjoy your day here. This is a really cool event uh, with lots of smart people. Um, I encourage you to use open source software, uh, open data, and, uh, and follow open standards whenever it makes sense. It's not always going to make sense. Uh, so as sort of a gray-haired guy who's been doing this stuff for a long time, don't bog down um, uh, too much uh, in trying to remain purists. Uh, you have to be pr pragmatic sometimes, and that's OK. Um, um, so I, ta I talk about the, uh, being, being pragmatic and mixing technologies. And uh, I encourage you to get involved in some of the technologies that are covered today. So uh, I think for many of you, GRASS is well known. It's a really cool project, actually. It's amazing to see some of the performance enhancements they're doing and some of the, the, the new user interfaces features. That's very, very exciting for me. Um, some of these new projects are projects that you probably haven't heard of before. So I encourage you to go up and talk to the speaker and, and get to know what they're doing. So, And uh, that's it. I think I probably have a couple minutes just for some quick questions if anybody has any. I should say one more thing. So if anybody wants some stickers, I got some stickers here. So uh, I uh, so it's amazing at this conference. The stickers just go crazy. Like pe everybody's grabbing the stickers and, and snatching them up. So uh, uh, please help yourself. So. Okay. If there's no questions, well, thank you very much for listening to me and uh, enjoy your day. So.